Welcome everyone to the Cal International Seminar with uh, Dr. Craig Meisner. This seminar is being recorded and broadcast on Facebook. We will be sharing the recording on the Cal's International Program's YouTube page and website, and everyone who has registered will receive an emailed link. I am Adrian Tucker, the Assistant Director of Cal's International Programs. In Cal's International Programs, we work to internationalize the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences through various opportunities, like hosting webinars of international researchers like this to help connect our students, faculty, and staff to international opportunities and partnerships. We partner with Cal's SAGE to offer these international seminars. Cal SAGE is a student association for international global engagement, or student association for international and global engagement for all College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at NC State. Today, we are happy to welcome Dr. Craig Meisner. Dr. Meisner has lived and worked in Bangladesh for 34 years in agriculture research with CIMIT, IRI, SIAT, ICRISAT, IMWI, WorldFish, IPRI, and most recently, FAO. Some of Dr. Meisner's and his team's accomplishments include demonstrating that in areas unsuited for boro winter rice production, that wheat and maize production were actually the most profitable alternative from the farmer's point of view, and that it frequently um, represent an efficient use of domestic resources. In fact, Bangladesh went from 3,000 tons in 1996 to now over 3 million tons of production, and it has the highest national yields in all of South Asia. They were able to improve wheat and maize yield crops, the crop yields in Bangladesh through implementing permanent raised beds, which produced an 18% higher wheat yield and reduced irrigation water requirements by 32% of wheat grown compared to flatbeds. They introduced hybrid maize to local growers and they increased yields 400%. And now most maize grown in Bangladesh is hybrid and 100% irrigated. Dr. Meisner also worked with Cornell University as a full adjunct professor in Bangladesh on permanent bed rice wheat cultivation, calcium deficiency induced rickets and, solarized, and soil solarization, especially with vegetable and tree nursery growers. He also investigated the impact of arsenic in the food change and proposed solutions to mitigate arsenic uptake in major cropping systems and thereby managing arsenic contamination from the environment and food chain. They also developed conservation agriculture in Bangladesh and Pakistan. And additionally, Dr. Meisner received the 2014 International Service Award for the American Society of Agronomy for distinguished work internationally. And from here, I'll turn it over to Dr. Meisner to share his presentation. And I welcome everyone to pose their questions in the chat box and we'll address these at the end of the seminar. So Dr. Meisner, you can share your screen. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. And uh, welcome to everybody who's on this um, live show. I, I, the title was not very catchy, I have to admit. But I wanted to have a goal of saying how everyone works in international agricultural science if they perform agricultural scientific research, because it is used internationally, as, the, as most of you know. And of course, then I want to talk about applications worldwide through my 39 year international career. So this seminar is not about me. It's about various teams within the multiple institutions for which I have worked. It was always teams, it was never me. This is about impacting rural families, especially the poor. And this is about changes to national crop production and its effects on human nutrition. Yes, I've worked 39 years overseas most extensively in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, but based from Bangladesh, 34 years in Bangladesh. I lived and worked in Cambodia for three years and Mexico for two. But I'll be emphasizing only the work in Bangladesh. 
So what I want to say is I want to talk about the successes of the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center with the National Agricultural uh, Research Institutes on wheat variety replacement, maize area yield and productivity increase, and some of the conservation machinery upscale. Then I want to talk about some of the uh, successes World Fish has had as a team in Bangladesh. And then Cornell University's impact in South Asia. I want to talk a little bit about two G GMOs that were introduced. One failed, one was quite successful. And then I want to share with you the tension in balancing research and development, especially living overseas. You cannot just do pure research. Very difficult. Uh, it's, 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 you want it to develop into technologies that are impacting people. And lastly, I'll talk about global changes requiring more strategic planning. And lastly, what I would do if I had to do it all over again. So let's start. Bangladesh was a rural country in 1950, hardly very a few urban centers. But as that grew in population, up to 170 million from 40 to 170 in 2019, it's growing more and more into urban centers, but still the vast majority lives in rural. It's called the Republic of Bangladesh. It's a parliamentary democracy. Uh, it's a majority Muslim, 87% with 12% Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, and others uh, minority. Sex ratio, males per uh, females is 100.3 in contrast to other countries in South Asia. Fertility rate currently is 2.3 children born per woman. It used to be four 20 years ago. Bangladesh, unlike India, had 100% of the sustainable development goals met. And, that's, and they're also well into reaching their millennial development goals as well. So it's progressed quite a bit. Labor force, there's 54 million in non-agriculture. 70% are males, but 30% are female. Distribution of labor, it's again, mostly agrarian, 24% uh, industry and 27% others. GDP is 250 billion uh, compared to North Carolina, which is 600. So not bad, no longer a poor country. Per capita income, 1,677, but there's a lot of per capita out there, 170 million. Population density is 1,200 persons per square, square kilometer compared to 67 in North Carolina. North Carolina and Bangladesh has the same land area. So you can just imagine how many people that is. GDP growth rate before COVID was 8% plus. They were one of three countries in the world that had above 8%, them and Bhutan and Ethiopia. And currently during the pandemic, it's still running at 6%. Principal industries are ready-made garments, pharmaceuticals, cement, garment accessories, chemicals, fertilizers, they manufacture 100% of their urea, newsprint, leather and leather goods. And not 20 years ago, it would have been unfinished leather. And the, what they export though, is ready-made garments, number two in the world, frozen foods, shrimp and fish, which is a, a budding industry, not just leather, but also leather products, jute, jute products, tea, ceramic tiles, textile fabrics. Cropping intensity, this is agriculture at a glance, is average, over two crops per year. So there are some places where they literally can have four crops uh, or more. Uh, and then there's some places in very lowland areas where they can only have one. And the farm size as defined by the government of Bangladesh is very small, it's less than a half an acre. Small, half an acre to two acres, medium, two acres to five, and a large above five acres. So very small land holdings. 100% lands are now tilled mechanically. And that's a fantastic success. 100% crops are sown, transplanted by hand. 
Until 10 years ago, most crops were threshed by hand. Now portable threshers are being rapidly upscaled. Up until 10 years ago, 100% of the crops were harvested by hand, but the government of Bangladesh subsidizes imported harvesters, so they're starting to be used. 100% fertilizer is hand delivered, 100% pesticides are hand sprayed, practically all crops are 100% irrigated except the pulses. And the good news for the irrigation is the aquifer in Bangladesh is 100% replenished each year. So crops are the major breakdown of agriculture sector, followed by a growing amount of livestock and fisheries, and forestry remains the same. This is the reason why it's 100% till. This is a two-wheel Chinese tractor imported from China. It looks clunky, it is, uh, but parts can be made locally. Um, and there's a, a, a cedar attached on the back, which we tried to upscale uh, with Simit in Erie. And in fact, this was a training course. I always said it was a team. This was my strong team with Simit for 13 years. And I enjoyed all aspects of working with these teams. Uh, this is a farmer in the blue shirt, Hanif. You'll be hearing about him later. This is bed sown wheat, and some of it will be permanent beds, which I'll talk about later. And I enjoy the farmers very much and being part of, of, of farming groups. I was honored to be able to work with Norm Borlock. I noticed you have. Bor uh, Borlaug scholars in the uh, international program. Well, you know, he worked at CIMIT in Mexico, so I would see him often in Mexico. We would talk a lot. Uh, I brought him even to Bangladesh, where the prime minister whisked him away to, up to the uh, Bangladesh Ag University and where he got an honorary degree in Bangladesh. So these are the list of the international institutions I've worked with. So CIMIT for th uh, two years in Mexico, 13 in Bangladesh. The IFDC based in Alabama for 1.5 years. ERI collaborated with. I was a full adjunct professor with Cornell, but all that work was in Bangladesh. I worked for the Australian Center for International Ag Research for three years in Cambodia. World Fish for four. International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics, ICRASAT, uh, International Center for Tropical Agriculture, uh, where I published a climate smart ag publication in Bangladesh, IFPRI for 1.5 years, World Vegetable Center, uh, cooperated at ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, I collaborated, and then lastly, Food and Agriculture Organization, Adrian reminded me, I actually did work with the International Water Management Institute as well. Uh, I left it out of the list. So lots of international organizations. And so I wanted to pause here. Adrian wanted me to explain how in the world I got involved with international research. Well, after my PhD from University of Georgia, I attended the American Society of Agronomy meetings. And like most societal meetings held yearly or, or biannually, they had jobs tables. Now, currently, I don't know if they do that during the pandemic, but they did at the time. So I went up to many of the uh, CGIR center tables and CIMIT, there happened to be a position open in Bangladesh. And so they whisked me out of Athens where I joined for two years in Mexico, going back and forth to Bangladesh, and then permanently to Bangladesh in 1992 with my family. And that's how it started. Um, you know, it just continued. Um, I, I knew I wanted to stay overseas, and I'm very grateful that my wife and children were uh, uh, agreeing to, to stay as well. Of course, two of my three sons were born there. Uh, and my wife was able to work at the American International School in Dhaka. So that's how we got involved. Um, 
I'm start, I want to start out talking about some of the production of the cereals. And I want to start out with this slide. I feel like I'm a good soil scientist. And without fertilizer, uh, you just could not raise a crop. But Bangladesh is fortunate that it, it manufactures its own urea fertilizer and does not subsidize it. Um, and it imports potassium and phosphorus uh, on the world market prices. So it's not subsidized. So it's very sustainable. Uh, and that's the good news for Bangladesh agriculture. And this is how it's get, uh, delivered all by hand. Let's look at wheat area. Wheat area peaked in 1999, close to a million, and the axis is the white one, uh, a million hectares. But since then, it's dropped uh, down to 350,000 hectares. Why? Well, the story of maize will come, come later, but that's the reason why. Um, production, however, obviously increased because of the yields. And the good news is uh, the wheat breeding program is so strong that the wheat continues to have good heat resistance. And that's what you need in wheat varieties in Bangladesh. And this ain't Kansas, but you can see the early planted wheat in front and the later, I'm uh, early planted in the back and the late planted up front, but it's good and healthy wheat crops. And these are the varieties that have replaced um, some of the older ones. And I'm sure since I took this slide, they probably have others. But again, uh, very good breeders, very good pathologists, make sure it doesn't have rust, it doesn't have uh, sheath blight, uh, all kinds of diseases that would be possible. Uh, uh, they stayed ahead of the heat. And then of course, bed planted wheat, was a paradigm shift for Bangladesh that we introduced as a team from CIMIT. Um, why? Because growers in the USA, Mexico, and Australia have adopted this practice. If you go to Australia, there's nothing's grown on the flat. In, in, in Mexico, all the farmers shifted to beds. And why? Well, because it shows substantial increases in yields, water savings from 25 to 50%. That alone uh, is certainly for Australia and Mexico in more drier conditions is, is an advantage. And the nitrogen responses at higher rates are, are, are better and there's less lodging. And so growers are beginning to adopt bed sown weed in South Asia. Uh, one of my colleagues, Peter Hobbs, worked his whole life on no tillage and, and bed sown wheat. And, um, He's now uh, uh, adjunct professor at Cornell University, but that's what happens. You have to work your whole life to get things up and running. And this is the bed former, and it also has a cedar. Now these are now being upscaled and manufactured by private companies. And it's through service providers that it's, it's really being upscaled big time. And here's the advantage for yield even at di three different rates of nitrogen, you can still see bed sown has a firm advantage. Why? Well, there's slightly less spikes per meter squared with bed sown, but, the, but with bed sown, you have longer spike length and you get a continuous border effect throughout the field. Those of you who work with grains know that when you do a crop cut for yield, you, it, you wanna avoid the border because, because you'll get a bias in your yield. You have less disease incidence, <clears throat> greater responses to nitrogen, less lodging, and all that equals the higher yield. Reapers are big, being <clears throat> beginning to be used in Bangladesh. It basically just cuts it and pushes it over to the side. Here's a... <clears throat> picture of training courses um, done with the reaper, again, <clears throat> on, on that Chinese hand tractor. And this is <clears throat> bed, permanent beds of wheat. 
in Northwest. And I guess, <clears throat> again, this is Honey, the champion of this. Um, and just to show you <clears throat> in contrast for flat and then um, um, beds, weed on beds, you can see <clears throat> firm advantage. This is how it's carried out from the field. So then we shifted from just bed sown wheat to permanent raised beds. This is a no, <clears throat> no tillage. So the bed and the furrow are maintained. You just reform it and you plant all the crops. Wheat followed by rice and then mung bean. And why? Because <clears throat> you can more timely sow. You have higher yields, better nutrient and water use efficiency, more diverse rotations. <coughs> I'm not used to talking as much. <laughs> Less use of fossil fuel, and it prevents residue burning. Better crop stands, lower costs, less water pollution, less groundwater mining, fewer weeds and pests, reduce costs and CO2 emissions, and then of course more carbon sequestration and better soil health. And beds are the way for raising rice in high arsenic soils to obtain normal yields due to <coughs> the aerobic nature of the beds. And up in the corner, <coughs> the left-hand corner, you can see the traditional way of irrigating wheat, just flood it on the flat, but with beds, uh, the advantage is you just fl flood the furrow. So you can, again, in a farmer's field, you can compare wheat on beds compared to the flat. So when we did our trainings, and this was in the 90s and continues till now, we do hands-on training at stations, bed former attachments are loaned to the groups. Uh, farmers have to agree to a wheat among rice rotation, and then technical backstop is given. And so far, just last year, there are 3,000 hectares of permanent beds. Now, compared to the 10 million hectares, that, that's nothing. However, the fact that this is sustainably being upscaled because it's all in the private company's service provider's hands. And the Wheat Research Center in Dinajpur, Northwest Bangladesh, um, it was always a dream that they would become a maize and wheat research institute. Well, in 2020, the WRC became indeed Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute. And the director general is a former PhD student of mine. So that's a proud moment for me. Now let's look at amazing maize in Bangladesh. Look at the area. It was next to nothing, 3,000 hectares up until 2003. And then it took off to uh, uh, currently 500,000 hectares. Um, the production again, the um, production just went up. I mean, obviously be, because even the, the low air, the, Areas that were growing it before 2000 were all open pollinated. And so you can see the yields on the, on the green axis on the right um, just jumped. Now, currently Bangladesh has the highest maize national average of all Asia. And why? It's all 100% hybrids. It's 100% irrigated and it's always uh, fertilized adequately. And I'll show you the proof is in the pudding. Uh, new crop, uh, people get excited about it with the budding uh, uh, poultry industry, uh, aquaculture and cattle feeding, more and more maize is required. Um, and they, Bangladeshis definitely eat maize. They've learned to like it, in fact. Um, So what, what happens, I, 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 we all knew it was gonna happen, you know, because maize is a heavy uh, extractor of nutrients from the soil. 
we started getting magnesium deficiencies. Um, and so uh, Bhutan has some of the most sustainable uh, uh, dolomitic, dolomitic lime mines uh, in the world. And so Bhutan started exporting to Bangladesh and private companies started uh, marketing it. And you can see the response you can get from one ton on the right compared to zero tons on the left. And it's now widespread use. Bangladesh users are very resilient and uh, clever. You know, they know they need to dry that corn down before the rain start. So look how they aligned it on their roof, in fact. <laughs> and who wouldn't be ashamed of this type of maize crop? Uh, and like I said, it, it's rare you see one that doesn't look like this. And just the benefits, what's the benefits of maize? Well, the family on your left was a landless family. They had 0.1 hect acres of land, only their homestead. But he was resilient, he was clever, he got a loan, he rented some land, he obviously had bought hybrid seed and fertilizer and made enough money in one season to build a new home. This is, he used to live in a straw hut and now he has a tin house. The family on your right used to have a tin house like that, but they, they had land holdings so they could do, do it more easily. They made enough profit to begin a brick home, a pucka home, and that's how it starts. It always starts out with rough brick and they'll finish it later. Rice production, you can't not talk about agriculture without talking about rice. And look, look at the uh, left-hand axis. This is 100,000 hectares, it's millions. And even though uh, rice has changed, uh, but the area of, of rice has not so much. And this is all rices. There's three rice crops. Um, in Bangladesh, there's a winter season, a boro we call it, then there's a monsoon, which is almond, and then there's a spring one, ouch. But look at the production and yields have continued to increase. Uh, a lot of it's due to more and more hybrid rice is being produced. Um, and so rice, hybrid rice seed are becoming more available. So it's bumping up the productivity of rice. This is what it looks like, a seed bed, and the, the plants are hand pulled from that seed bed. And yes, a lot of times it is women and children. Clever Bangladeshis, they know if they put out a bamboo stick in their rice fields, they get birds and birds consume a lot of insects. And that's one of the clever ways they can uh, get insect control. If you live in the up north where the tribals are, if you have rodent damage in your rice field, well, they bring out their bow and arrows. They're very skillful at controlling rats. And indeed, Bangladesh National Anthem calls Bangladesh golden Bangladesh. And when all the rice ripens, uh, especially if it's the same variety in, in fields, it does look as golden as this. So how is it harvested? again by hand. Uh, this happens to be a more uh, uh, um, fragrant rice. So it, 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 it was slightly lodged and taller. But in contrast to that, this is rice on permanent beds. You can even see the wheat straw uh, in the furrows. And so uh, after wheat, they'll just literally you know, cut the stalks off and leave the straw, and then you plant the, uh, a transplant for the rice in the uh, beds. Again, contrasting rice on beds compared to rice uh, conventional way. I put this slide in because I need to say that rice is not so profitable 
and a lot of a lot of farmers are getting out of rice pr production. There used to be a social stigma if you were a farmer and you had some land holdings. If you were caught buying rice at the market, it was it meant you didn't have enough for your family. And in the you know eighties, nineties, you know early two thousand, that was stuck. But nowadays, you know, farmers are now the sons or daughters of the old farmers, and they want profit. So this is a picture showing you Mango Grove. They started it, it's on a mound, but they'll still grow rice. Rice productivity will go down, but they'll start getting mangoes. And I've seen this in many of the districts, um, uh, shifting out of rice and going toward more diverse cropping patterns. And why? Because, even though Bangladesh is self-sufficient um, in rice, uh, we're next to the, a large country, India. We're, in fact, some people call us the, we're the armpit of India. But India heavily subsidizes its rice and wheat production. And so, whereas rice is not, quote, formally imported so much, the borders are very porous. So rice will fill, come from India. And because of that, I think that's why more farmers are going out of paddy rice production. Farmers rally are always fun. Uh, this is a long time ago, 2003, an integrated pest management rally where the minister was there, some even some uh, ambassadors came, and this is what they look out on. So lots and lots of interested people come to these rallies. And then there's other rallies that may not have some as big of a deal, but there's still a lot of fun to have farmers and around. And of course, as a foreigner, I always attract attention, especially the young kids uh, being fluent in Bangla. I always enjoyed uh, kidding around with the kids. Need to talk about lentil area, partly because it's declined. Uh, productivity, though, and yields had kept on going up, uh, as well as chickpea. Look what happened to chickpea. It is almost non-existent, despite yields continuing to increase. So why is that? And is that something you're proud of as, as a cereal uh, scientist? No. The reason is these legumes, chickpea and lent chickpea especially, and lentil to a, a, a sec secondary degree, is susceptible to early rains. So if you get an early rain in March, the chickpea and lentil would have started flowering. It shifts back to vegetative growth and just never recovers. And chickpea is the worst. So that's one of the reasons why uh, the lentil and chickpea has gone down. Let me shift now and talk about fish. Uh, if you th compare these two charts, you can see that inland culture fisheries in blue in 1983, that's, and that's aquaculture pond. And compare it then to 2017 where it's 56%. So it's a real percentage shift um, Whereas inland capture, probably as far as production, did not decrease, um, but in percentage-wise, it, it took a second to the cap uh, to the uh, aquaculture, and we are one of the leading fish-producing countries in the world. We produce 4.1 million metric tons in 2017, which is a surplus against demand. So it contributes to a daily consumption average of 63 grams of fish per person. So that's important because Bangladeshis say something, a mantra about themselves, Mache Bate Bengali. It means uh, fish and rice consumption makes a Bengali. Okay, so that's important. And of course, she's holding up shrimp. Um, household pond aquaculture, horticulture is a very much a woman-friendly package. 
why this technology? Because low cost fish polyculture technology uh, is involving women, better utilization of the homestead pond for fish cultivation, as well as the unused embankment and courtyard, they can grow vegetables. And farmers produce carp and tilapia mainly as income sources and the small indigenous species or mola are used for household cons consumption. These are the small fish. I wanted to give credit to one of my colleagues who I worked four years with, Kuntala uh, Tilsed. Uh, she is the World Food Prize winner. Her mantra was about these small indigenous fish. Um, they're prized in Bangladesh as food. In fact, you know, it, it's more expensive than the carp. But in the past, they always cut off the heads. And by cutting off the head, they're cutting off the biggest source of vitamin A. So Shakuntala's, you know, just went around all kinds of training and make sure that people understand nutrition. And she definitely deserves this World Food Prize. And I'm proud to have worked with her for four years. Bangladesh is uh, lots of rivers, so lots of boats. <clears throat> Shrimp, you saw it was an export item. Uh, it's low pro productive fish a shrimp actually it's an indigenous species not not the white-legged shrimp that we buy in our grocery store uh it's, they don't apply feed to it so it it almost could be called organic but um it's it's a big uh deal why where shrimp are grown in the southwest where all that pink zone is showing that this is undulated land or waterlogged land and then because of the Ganges water going off in India due, due to dams. There's less water coming down the Ganges and you're having a lot of salt water infusion into the uh, uh, river and areas. So that's one reason why shrimp was a reaction. Uh, again, Bangladeshis are extremely resilient. This would have you know, killed the whole land if they were dependent only on rice, but they shifted the shrimp and it's made an industry. So I wanted to share some stories of my career. In 1992, when I moved with my family to Bangladesh, um, I definitely wanted to address uh, uh, women and the needs of women in agriculture. So. I hired a consultant who did a survey and went to various places uh, interviewing women in the, in, farm, in the farm, asking what their perception of how they work on the farm. And the woman's perception was mind boggling. They feel like they're very active in doing not just you know, household work, but actual agricultural work. Um, so the perception is, you know, they're involved. And so, so we started having whole family training with wheat and then with maize and then with fish because, you know, what a husband and a wife decide among themselves uh, what they're gonna do, it's their business. We treat them equal and train the whole family whole family. And I think that's some of the key of our team's success in wheat, maize, as well as fish. Uh, I used to brag with Simit that in those 13 years, I had a, raised a budget of $11 million to do uh, some of the research and training. When I became country director of rural fish, my yearly budget was 12 million. So, you know, it, it I think uh, some of the technologies, as well as the training, you know, brought, you know, credible, measurable success. This is a story when I was World Fish Country Director. We, as we, uh, I say we, uh, Simit and Erie, three of the country directors uh, were going to visit a village where all the technologies were, were trained. 
so maize, wheat, fish. Um, and so there was a farmer's rally and sure enough, all the farmers were seated down and we were gonna speak. So I, I, rather than give a speech, I asked them, I was the only one in the country directors that could speak Bangla. I asked them, what technology is it of all that we've taught is the best? Well, immediately, one young man raised his hand with a book and he said, he shop accounting. <laughs> it's remarkable. It, it was life changing for me <clears throat> because it, it made me realize they want to treat it as a business now and not just technology, not just farming. It's a business. And that's, that's good. I will be speaking about GMOs in Bangladesh in a little bit, but I also want to make the statement before I talk about GMOs that Bangladesh is a science respecting country. I, I'll be frank with you. I, as a scientist, there was so much respect. Uh, there's no anti-vaxxers in Bangladesh. I, there's none. No one would even think about not having a vaccine. So it is a science loving country. And for that reason, uh, Cornell University with USDA in Hawaii, as well as uh, a university in Thailand, we're going to um, try to get a transgenic um, papaya released. And this is what ring spot looks like. It, it literally reduces productivity six times. And the goal of this project was affordable sweet papaya for the poor. So in Thailand, the transgenic looks like this and susceptible looks like that. Again, so transgenic is six times more productive. However, having prepared the Bangladesh Ag Research Institute for accepting field tests, well, not greenhouse testing, uh, uh, all the safety standards you need, uh, regulations that you need for introduction of such a GMO, uh, were trained and uh, we found out though that before we even brought it, that the strain of the ring spot disease itself in Bangladesh was different. And so the transgenic in Thailand became susceptible. So that was a failed attempt. However, later, this is a, a field of eggplant. Eggplant is the most endeared vegetable in Bangladesh, but to have good uh, marketable eggplant, studies show farmers spray eggplant 60 to 70 times per season because of the uh, borer. Uh, there's a borer insect that just ha wrecks havoc with that. So again, Cornell University uh, with the US AID help and Monsanto uh, gave for free a BT gene. I, I don't want to explain it. I assume most people know, know what BT gene is. They also gave it to India at the same time. Well, the good news is three years ago, it was introduced after it had been tested. And I mean, we we're talking about strict uh, testing regulations that are present even in this country were done in Bangladesh through the Ag Research Institute. Once they released it three years ago, it now represents over 50% of the market. And why? No spray. So not only savings of the spray, people, consumers were more afraid of the insecticide than they were of the BT gene. And if you ask a consumer, do they know it's GMO? They'll say yes, and they'll explain, okay? Tension in balancing research and development. Well, you know, I was a member of AAS and I did get my science magazines, but it was, it's always a tension. You want to be a pure scientist, but yet you want to affect uh, technological changes that have influenced people's lives. And it's always been a tension. But, and, like the upscaling of the machinery, you have to work long and hard to make things work. And again, I point 
to my colleague, Peter Hobbs, who lived in South Asia his whole life and constantly, constantly, and only now after he's long retired, is that technology being taken up. Some of the global challenges that we're facing, uh, I just wanna make the list, I won't discuss it, but certainly global warming, there are food crises existent, uh, mostly are human made, interestingly, uh, but they will come. They will come as the population increase. Certainly the challenge of agrobiofuels, and then we want to maintain sustainable food systems and nutrient delivery systems thinking holistically. And why? Okay, remember that graph? I, uh, I mean, the map I showed, this is the sea level rise by 2050 predicted. And you see where <laughs> shrimp farmers might not mind, but there'd be a lot of other people uh, greatly affected by what's gonna happen. Lastly, what I would do if I had to do it all over again? Well, my whole career was on production, yields and production. However, I was influenced by uh, my colleagues in Cornell University who thought differently. You need to think about health and well being. And so, as you do that, you think of different in, in, uh, interventions to the system. Certainly, yes, more efficient, productive cereals. That's where I centered my goals. But, and certainly more legumes and veggies to feed more people. Um, make crops less risky to environment, we've always been working on, uh, but more micronutrient loading by plants is a new thought. Uh, management that enhances nutrients, not just agronomic practices that increase yield or make efficient use of nutrients in the plant, but enhance nutrients uptake in the plant. And then, Communication, education, multifaceted approaches like drama. Of course, DVD shows when this slide was made. Who, do you, who uses DVDs anymore? Uh, cooking to enhance nutrients. But again, the point of, of, of thinking holistically is health and well being. So I, I did want to uh, share this fact. Bangladesh in 1950s had no tomatoes, no, they didn't eat tomatoes, but it is introduced and slowly now, every, almost every meal, they'll have a salad with cucumber and tomatoes and such that it even has summer varieties. So it's all year round. So it went from zero to about being, you know, uh, uh, eaten quite a bit. Carrots. In 1980, I didn't mention this, for eight, seven years I was a missionary, ag missionary in Bangladesh, and uh, from our farm we grew lovely carrots. When we tried to market them, we could not give them away. Now to this day, if you order vegetable curry throughout Bangladesh, it will always have carrots. So it's a shift in uh, thinking about nutrition and eating. Seven years ago, the Bangladesh Ag Research Institute introduced dragon fruit. It's a cactus. Uh, I, I've not seen it here in the States, but seven years ago, it is so desirable and profitable that every market in villages, not just city, but villages will have this marketed. So it shows, the, again, the shift of thinking in a farm as a business and profitability and nutrition. I always end my PowerPoints with a picture of a Hindu temple. This was near the Wheat Research Institute. So I, I visited it often and it's a typical, uh, but it's terracotta. It's built in 1750. Um, and it's the typical Hindu temple that has uh, various scenes of Hindu cosmology. However, on the base is this, and this makes it probably, it is the most unique Hindu temple in the world because it 
has a mogul motif, basically affirming Islam, a Hindu temple that affirms Islam. And so uh, I think it's also typical of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a fiercely secular country. Um, but if Hindu temple builders were willing to break in new paradigms for building temples, I think we must make a greener revolution that delivers nutrients to communities for the health and well being. So that's all I'd like to say. And I'm open for any questions. If you'd like to raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patterson, go ahead. I see you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Uh, Craig, can you hear me? Yes. I shall never forget a long time ago, you made a comment about arsenic coming down from the mountains, hmm. not very soluble in water, but enough so that it made its way into the rice paddies. And when the mother would go up to um, collect the rice, sometimes the child would be contaminated. Hmm. Is, is, uh, is arsenic still a problem in Bangladesh? Um, yes, it is, to say it isn't. Uh, however, you know, if it, it's kind of a, a double whammy if you're if you're uh, uh, have poor nutrition because basically if you eat enough dolls and, and protein, the body is able to detoxify arsenic. Wonderful. Yeah. So it's it's still a problem though, but it only hits those that, that are, have poor nutrition. So if you have good nutrition that small amount of arsenic is not, is not a, 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 an inhibitory factor. That's correct. But it, okay. it will, it can affect, you know, plants. If, if you brought up enough uh, arsenic from the uh, groundwater and it builds up in the soil, it's in the, if you look at the periodic table, it's in the same family as phosphorus. So it's readily adheres to the clay particles. So yeah, it, but it's not so widespread. And again, permanent beds would, would ameliorate the effects, having more aerobic conditions. Well, so you're, the, to... you're the Bob Patterson that was with, with as a professor with me, yeah. right? Yes, yes. That's what I thought. But I, good to see you. Craig, thank you so much for all that you've shared with us today. You, you've given us so much to think about. We're so Your humanity and your scientific prowess are are so evident. Thank you so much for today, what oh, you've done you. for all of us. So, I don't know, I, I just put my hand up. I don't know if I can speak or not, but Craig, yeah. you know you uh, know that I was there on the arsenic mitigation project in uh, 2006 <laughs> to 2009. Right. And of course, the, the real problem, of course, I mean, if you look at Bangladesh in, in, in a grid-like fashion, in the Northeast and Dinantpur, they have very little arsenic in the groundwater and perhaps more uh, appropriate or misappropriate or whatever the word is, is, uh, is manganese, which uh, at very high levels, uh, more than 300 parts per million, which can cause uh, deleterious effects to people's uh, health as well in children and, of course, like uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, uh, symptoms in older adults. So, but uh, certainly in in other parts of the uh, the country, if you look in the southwest uh, quadrant, then uh, you get up to two thousand parts per billion of uh, arsenic in the groundwater. We know the WHO, USA EPA standards are about ten parts per billion. So, so you know it's it, and I don't know what the uptake is in terms of. Uh, groundward water extracted uh, for irrigation purposes for plants, but but certainly the arsenic content in the groundwater varies uh, all over the country. And you know, but the worst part is along the uh, the western border with uh, Bangladesh and and India, with up to two thousand parts per billion, as I say, microliters, micrograms per liter. How do you say that? And then various levels. Uh, uh, in the other south uh, east quadrant and north uh, east quadrant. So, so in that respect, and I don't know that it's flowing down the rivers from uh, from no. 
No, it's it's, 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 it's definitely the groundwater. Yeah, it's a groundwater uh, problem. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, there's. I think it's fair to sort of point that out. Uh, uh, anyway, I don't. Have I did. Say, so. I remember him. Him. <laughs> hey, Craig. I, I see yeah. uh, Suman. Suman has his hand up. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I have. A, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, so first of all, Dr. Uh, Misner, it was a wonderful talk. And I really enjoyed your talk because I live, I'm from West Bengal, just the oh. other side of uh, the western part of Bangladesh. Yep. And my home is actually like 20 minutes away from the India-Bangladesh border. Yep. I live very close to that. So uh, Bangladesh, they have a lot of problem with arsenic and iron pollution, yeah. which is uh, a lot of people, I mean, both of uh, the two professors, they ask questions about arsenic pollution, but I just want to know about some solutions. So how can uh, agricultural solutions can be used or utilized to address arsenic and iron pollutions? Is there any sustainable way? Because being a biochemistry student, I know that there are some plants that can suck uh, some particular metals or uh, elements from the soil. So do you have any potential solution using agriculture as a tool? Well, yes. I think the solution would be to grow rice under aerobic conditions on beds. Because again, arsenic is in the same category as phosphorus. So it's going to be fixed to the soil. If, it's, if arsenic is there under aerobic conditions, it's more fixed to the soil and you'll get less uh, into the plant. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing. And in this last, I mean, you, you, you started working in Bangladesh in 1992. So it's been like almost uh, 28, 30 years now. Well, I didn't, I didn't go back further because actually through Bob Patterson, I got a chance under the auspices of the Presbyterian Church to be an agricultural missionary from 1980 to 87. <laughs> so, 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 like, uh, as you know, Bangladesh or India, these countries, they perform very poorly in the hunger index, global hunger index. Mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and that comes from the reason that the food we contain is not enough nutrient rich because it is full of rice or wheat. So in these last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, mm -hmm. since you started working in Bangladesh, did you see any significant change in the eating pattern, people eating more nutrient rich food? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, it, I don't have to, I, I could quote data and show it, maybe we'll do that later, but uh, it's changed dramatically. And part of it is cheap fish. Pungus now yeah. is, is a poor person can afford pungus fish, it's a catfish. And uh, as far as fruits and vegetables, the consumption rate has changed dramatically even the last five years, okay? Wheat, although you saw, you know, it, 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 it's not, uh, it's not self-sufficient in wheat. 19 at 2018 Bangladesh was the fourth largest importer of wheat to so dramatically shifts and of course you're young ask your mother and father wheat uh, japati was considered a poor man's food or they had some some problem with it and maybe that had to be because Pakistan they liked wheat they liked japatis and so they didn't want to be like Pakistanis because they had war with them but so no, now I'd say people eat wheat twice a day and rice only one time a day. So it, yeah. That's wonderful, Dramatic. yeah. I mean, things are changing. Bangladesh has been one of those uh, example, basket case example of how a young nation can prosper yep. so quickly. So, yes. Well, in fact, I, you know, I, I, I've visited West Bengal many times, many times, and I'm um, you know, have you been to Dhaka? Uh, not really. Cause... Okay, you compare Calcutta to Dhaka, it's like dramatic. Now, really? yes, very dramatic. I mean, so the amount of development that's occurred, and of course it's garment industries, 
um, certainly in exports. And like I said, you saw the GDP yep. is half of North Carolina. Well, that's not bad. Uh, yeah. And the thing is, like in West Bengal, uh, since you know the political situation a little yes. bit, I guess. So I do, a long right. term, yeah, West Bengal had that. Kind. That is another thing why West Bengal didn't grow as that's the right. same place as Bangladesh. Well, you know, listen, I, it was a, a great contrast to me because Bangladesh are very extremely capitalistic. Mm -hmm. And of course, West Bengal is very socialistic. Um, I used to be a socialist till, until I came to Bangladesh and the, I, I switched. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so I have a kind of a personal question uh, to you, if you don't mind, but it is more career related. Well, I, I'll tell you what, one, I'll, I'll give my telephone number on the chat and you can call me because let's, let's, let's let other persons. Any, any other questions? Yourself. Oh, go ahead. Hi, Craig. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize me on the computer screen or not. It's been probably 20 years or more we'll, we last talked. Uh -huh. So this is Ro Rauf Mian. Uh -huh. Do you recall? recall? Yes, um, I do. I'm now at the NC State uh, USDA, actually, uh, as the research leader of the Soybean Research Unit here on campus. Yep. I saw your name, uh, so I said I must say hello, and we'll catch up later on. Uh, uh, but thank you so much for such a nice presentation about Bangladesh. You know I'm from Bangladesh. Yes, I do know that. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. 98 probably was the last time we talked, I think. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So we'll catch up. Uh, yeah, let's catch uh, up, for sure. All right. I, uh, I gave my uh, telephone But again, thanks chat. for the presentation, and uh, obviously you you know, I go to Bangladesh maybe once every couple of years. Okay. A lot of things have changed as you have presented here. And yeah. there are a lot more potential there too, you know, mm -hmm. to go. And um, I'm planning to probably retire sometime soon and go there. If yep. you're still there, we can work together perhaps. <laughs> well, no, I've retired. I would love to go back as short-term consultant. But okay. Chapel yeah, Hill. maybe we can put something together to do something together. Okay? Yeah, that's all right. Good. Thank you. I'll catch up with it. Okay. You, if I can get your email and phone number, I can. Okay. I can. Phone I can talk to you online. Chat box. Um, maybe a uh, Lindsay. Yeah. Adrian can probably Lindsay provide us. all the emails, so I'll ask Lindsay to send out my contact numbers to everybody. Okay. okay. We'll include yeah, it yeah. in the follow-up email. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice to see you after so long time. Yeah, good to see you. Alaikum assalam. And I have to say this, I see my old colleague Richard, not old in age, but uh, old in years together, uh, Richard Leppert. Looks like you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, very much enjoyed your talk and really enjoyed seeing you. Yep. And uh, yeah, interesting to hear that you're back in Carolina now too. Yep. Return to yep. Carolina. Yeah, Return I know. Carolina. Those at those at NC State are gonna say, "Why are you in Chapel Hill?" Well, just that's that's where we wanted to retire. <laughs> Yeah, I just, one thing I just mentioned, Craig did some other really interesting work related to rickets, which was a tremendous yes. problem yeah. in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't put it all into a 45 minute <laughs> presentation. So I de-emphasized the arsenic and I did want to put it in because it was fascinating. Yeah, and I learned a lot about nutrition. You know, if I may, I know that you spent some time in Cambodia, and of course, they also yeah. have an arsenic problem as well. So, you know, and, and of course, that's coming down from the make or yeah. initially. A lot of actually Delta countries in the world, about 88 or 90 countries in the world, have some level of arsenic problem mm -hmm. in the groundwater. But I know this is about Bangladesh, but were there any, can you draw any similarities between your experience in Cambodia and, uh, and Bangladesh? Uh, no, because, you know, when I went to, bon uh, to Cambodia, the agricultural minister had a little red book. 
And in, when it came to fertilizer, it was a big X. Don't use pesticide, don't use fertilizers. And so guess what? They were also using SRI, which no agronomist is gonna fault SRI, but it's, that's not the mantra you're gonna get your rice production up. Uh, system of rice intensification. Is it, it, so he started, uh, my accomplishment there, and I have a picture of it, he started using our blue book, which talked and educated farmers about fertilizers, both organic and non-organic. We talked about um, seed preservation. We also had to talk about herbicides because pea farmers were using it and they just didn't know because again, the ag, and so, okay. So then the ag minister, I won him over. Okay. And so, it was not similar because Bangladesh has always used fertilizer and, and pretty much, you know, are respecting more and more of the pesticide and pesticide regulations. So that it was difficult. That's the only thing I can say comparing the two. All right, we'll take one more question from uh, Dr. Farouk. Uh, Dr. Craig Meisner, thank you very much for telling the story of Bangladesh more than half of a century started in 1961, though you are more than 30 years, you are very much a tested friend of Bangladesh. Thank I'm you, very happy and very much delighted to yep. see the transformation of agriculture. It's a basketless, it's, it's a basketless country, now it's a food sufficient country. Yes. And a group, a good number of developments you are witnessed mm -hmm. uh, as a friend of Bangladesh. So yep. I'm very happy to see the, uh, the, 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 the very informative presentation started from rice to wheat and the maize boom mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. Yep. So one thing, <clears throat> with your long-term experience with working with Bangladesh, it's mm -hmm. agriculture, fisheries, and the rural people especially. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think, what is the more pressing challenges for the agriculture perspective in Bangladesh? Present most yeah. pressing challenges. Thank you. Well, you know, it has to do with road transport nowadays. You know, marketing. I mean, it's, you, 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 you just came from there. I mean, traffic is horrendous, horrendous. Road conditions are horrible. And, you know, it, whereas it took, I remember I told you, it took two hours to go to Miami Singh. And now yeah. it can take five to six if, if, if you arrive. It's so, and it affects marketing. So that's the most pressing for agriculture is good roads, discipline on the roads and transportation. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, the, the, the two months before I visited uh, Virginia Tech and I had a discussion with the Virginia Tech Cooperative Extension Director, Ed Jones. Uh -huh. And he asked me, what is the most important challenges of agriculture in Bangladesh? And I also mentioned him like you, it's a yeah. marketing, marketing yeah. problem. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Meisner, and thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and, and participation and attendance. And um, thank you um, again. This is getting lots of thumbs up from <laughs> Dr. Patterson and lots of smiles. So that's that's always a good sign. So I appreciate everyone's participation and lots of good um, good comments in the chat. So. Thank you. And again, this will be um, sent out to everyone who registered. So um, you can share it widely and we'll have Dr. Meisner's contact information in that email for anyone who wants to follow up. So um, thank you again. Okay, I appreciate thank you. it. Okay, thanks. Do Craig sometime okay. soon. Yes. I, I live in Cary. Okay, let's get together. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Not a bad.